Parlay. He calls us from Washington, D.C., in the midst of voting up there. And I understand that it's a, a very fluid situation with you, Scott. You might have to step away for a vote or, or whatnot. But I appreciate you being on the Murphy Show on Super Talk with us. How are you, my friend? Doing great. Glad to be with you. We already cast our first vote, so I'm just uh, waiting for the second one. All so right. We'll see. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get this in if they keep the vote open long enough. Well, Scott was agreeable to come on with us even during the vote, and I said, look, if you're willing, I'm willing. If you have to step away, just say, Murph, i got to go, got to vote, and then we'll get you back in a second, and I'll fill, okay? I, I love the idea. So, Scott, uh, a lot of people want me to ask you this question first and foremost, and I don't want any pussyfooting around on this one, Scott. I want a yes or no, and I, nobody cares if you're in the House of Representatives. Did you vote for Rick Scott or not? Nobody cares that you're not in the Senate. <laughs> I supported Rick Scott, but I didn't have a vote, unfortunately. <laughs> no excuses. No excuses. Deja. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, there's a, there a lot of attention being focused on that, but uh, not a lot in the House. I mean, it seems to be less, um, uh, from a top end at least, less uh, conversation about changing uh, the Speaker of the House. I think Mike Johnson is uh, solidly supported by most of the Republicans. Is that not the case? Uh, it is. I mean, there may be a few people. There's nobody running against him today. We have those elections here right after we finish this vote series. And to my knowledge, he's running unopposed. But, of course, the uh, the big test is on January 3rd when, when everybody sings out who they're for. And if we're going to have, a, as I was quoted in the NBC uh, uh, blank show, um, I know you have a family, a family <laughs> radio show, but that didn't stop them from printing it in NBC. But, um, you know, I would like to think that on January 3rd we stay united and, and we don't put on a spectacle like we did uh, last time with Kevin McCarthy. But, you know, Trump was in the conference this morning. Elon Musk was in there and, you know, spirits were high. Trump said, you know, he was uh, very supportive. I don't know that he actually endorsed Mike Johnson. But, um, you know, we're going to have a slim majority again. We've got the Senate now. We have no option but to govern and no excuses, as you said at the top of the hour on the other question. You know, we, we've got to get things done. We've got to unite as a conference. And, uh, you know, you don't often get this opportunity. So uh, we we got to deliver. I mean, uh, uh, beyond that, just uh, speak a little further about what you think the message was last Tuesday. I, I was I just felt so good about the American people seeing through uh, the nasty, angry, vitriolic narrative that the media had presented, the caricature that they had presented of Donald Trump as this evil authoritarian. Americans are just smarter than that. And I, I feel like these are wallet issues. These are pocketbook issues. Uh, they just want to see America succeed in the things uh, that we're trying to accomplish and benefit their own communities. What What's your takeaway, Scott? It's hard to say it much better than you did. I, I talked to my chief that morning. I said, my heart tells me we're going to win 312 to 226. I'm um, honest truth. And I said, my head tells me be afraid because of what happened in 2020. And I'm like you. It's like we have a fraud for a candidate. They're running on a message of fear mongering, calling us Hitler and, and uh, you know, every name that they could think of and talk about anything but the issues that were the economy and the border and the things that mattered to people. And I like to believe that the American people were smarter than that. And they, they proved you right and me right. And, and thank God it gives me hope that uh, the American dream is alive and well and, and that uh, – you know, we have a chance to right this ship. I mean, and I understand that you don't want to get into the other body's um, business. Uh, when we talk about the Congress of the United States, you want to stay in your lane in the House. But I, I'm curious your takeaway from the Senate vote today. Are, are we as Tennesseans, are we as Americans making a little more of this than we should in terms of Rick Scott going down in defeat? Scott had presented himself as kind of the Trump guy, Thune and Cornyn. Yeah. Uh, they had been, you know, a little, I mean, they, I mean, I, we've seen the quotes, we've played the comments, they said a few nasty things back in the day about Donald Trump. Uh, are we making more of this than we should? And do you think that this will stymie any push for the Trump agenda? Well, you know, I think Tennessee spoke loud and clear. If you'd had my cell phone for the last two to three days, um, <laughs> the number well, of calls I got from not just people you'd consider far right conservatives, but I mean, my dentist, pharmacist, everyone was calling, you know, wanting to make sure that both our senators voted for Rick Scott. I, I can't even count the number of texts and phone calls and messages I had on, on people uh, having that be their preference. So clearly the red states think that Rick Scott would have been more Trump friendly. Um, you know, being a former South Dakotan, I moved to Tennessee in 93 from South Dakota. 
it's interesting that, you know, we had Tom Daschle as a majority leader and then John Thune beats him in 12. And now we got John Thune as a majority leader, but I, I hope that he's Trump friendly. Um, I don't know that there's concerns about that, but, um, you know, let, let's see McConnell, you know, he's getting towards the end of his career and I don't think he cared much what other people thought he, you know, he seemed like a wise old owl at times. And then other times he seemed like an obstructionist. So I hope John Thune will, uh, have a clear mind, listen to the mandate that was pretty uh, resounding across America on November 5th. And, and they want to, they want to see uh, the America first a MAGA agenda, if you want to call it that uh, put in place. And, and I hope that he helps facilitate that. As, as you watch some of the selections uh, that Donald Trump has announced over the last several days, there are a number coming from the house of representatives um, I, I'm certain that you've spoken to a number of members about this, or I imagine it's a topic of conversation. I mean, there's no, I mean, it's a razor thin majority that will be in the House of Representatives, right? So there's no real fear that some of these selections picking off House members will impact the numbers in the in the House of Representatives, is there? Well, you know, we have concerns in terms of timing. Uh, you know, at least Stefanik is probably going to be uh, confirmed for UN secretary. I think she'll do a great job. Sit next to her on armed services. I'll miss having her uh, next to me. But, um, uh, you know, New York, is ca- Governor Hochul will drag it out as long as possible on the, on the special election. I think she's got seven to ten days once the lease officially resigns to name the date and then up 60 to 90 days to uh, have the election. So I guarantee it'll be about 100 days to get her safe Republican seat replaced. DeSantis in Florida with uh, Waltz, you know, will have a lot more discretion to speed that one up. So, you know, they can pick off a couple. Let's assume we end up with 222, which is, is probably fair, 221, 222. So we're already down two, but that takes a little bit of time for that process to take place. Um, I don't think Trump's going to try to take anybody else immediately because those numbers are so close. But uh, once we refill those other two seats, uh, you know, I think it's possible that uh, there could be a couple more. Uh, we have you know, a lot of talent in the House that uh, you know, can go different places. The pace that he's been picture, uh, picking these people has been dizzying. You know, his first term, it was like, I don't know, two, three months in, and he'd only filled about a quarter of the position. So I guess he's taking a different approach this time, and, and there's – I mean, Secretary of Defense, I don't even really know much about the guy. Uh, uh, Christy Nome, Department of Homeland Security, I don't know. She's in South Dakota. She talks stuff on it. So, you know, I, I don't know. These uh, picks are coming quick. I think some of them are great. Some of them I, you know, think maybe he could take a little more time. But back to your original question, the numbers in the House are concerning in the sense that if somebody's sick, if somebody's plane gets delayed, you know, I guess if it's a big vote, we can always move the vote to the following week. But uh it's a slim majority, and as you saw last Congress, or I guess we're still in the 118th Congress, it's like herding cats, and we really need to unite and speak uh, freely with the Senate and the White House to make sure that we get our big-ticket items through and we get some people that you know just can't get to yes to get to yes and accept a little bit of compromise on, on some of the more important issues. Talking with Representative Scott Desjardins about the 118th Congress that is in session right now and the incoming 119th Congress. So do you expect or have there been any conversations thus far? Maybe it's too early. Um, do you expect the rules to be the same? I mean, I understand that the razor thin majority necessitated um, acquiescing to uh, certain members of the Freedom Caucus and other groups uh, that demanded that they have an ability to uh, you know, call the speaker to the carpet on the floor, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, do you yeah. expect that those rules will move forward into the 119th, or does everything kind of reset in January? It, it, uh, we have rules conference uh, tomorrow, and uh, okay. we have amendments, and we'll see what happens. And, and you know, I'd like to see him get rid of the single-person motion to vacate the chair. Uh, I don't like that rule that any one person can do it, because in a slim majority, every Democrat's going to vote against your speaker. So literally three or four people can oust a speaker. Last time it took eight Republicans and all the Democrats to oust a speaker. I think you know, a lot of times uh, the, the conservative base doesn't want to bring a bill to the floor where you don't have the majority of the majority, and I think that's fair. But I also think that uh, it should take a, a larger number to oust a speaker. Is I mean, yeah, somebody may be upset because their bill didn't get brought to the floor. So we're going to get rid of the speaker. And, and that just uh, you know, creates dysfunction. And we witnessed that last uh, or during this Congress. And I, I think it was a bad look for us. And, and 
we have a real opportunity to get things done and we don't need uh, as, as i told the nbc reporter we don't need a, a a ble- yes, uh, and, and by the way, and by the way, I mean you—you've just demonstrated, Scott, that you're busy in D.C. doing your thing because you don't listen to our show very much because we're most definitely not a family show. <laughs> That's a joke. I was kidding. Uh, listen, so what people want to know what priorities are. I mean, people want to know. I mean, I, I understand that these, I mean, you know, the big ship takes time to turn around, but we're $35 trillion in debt. We're excited about some of these announcements. I mean, maybe we should be, maybe we shouldn't be, but, you know, the Department of Government Efficiency, I dig it. I, I think it's oh, time yeah. that we, uh, you know, you know how when when you get too much undergrowth in a forest, sometimes you kind of have to burn that undergrowth off yep. to make the forest thrive. I think that's it's high time we did that in government bureaucracy. Do you agree? I, uh, people are going to have to buckle up because if if we're going to do what Elon Musk and Vivek uh, Ramswamy are going you know wanting to do, cut two trillion, everyone thinks that sounds great until they cut their spending, and then you're going to have to say, well, suck it up, Buttercup, because. You know, this is going to go across government. If we're going to get rid of government waste, like they're talking about, eliminate the Department of Education. Amen. Let's do it. And let's cut government jobs and clean out this deadwood and the undergrowth in the forest. But along the way, you know, it's going to hit home to some people and people are going to have to say, be careful what you ask for. But if if we're going to uh, deal with Social Security and Medicare uh, insolvency, that's going to take some tough votes and a lot of courage. But if, if we want those programs to be around, we're going to have to have some tough conversations. And no politician wants to talk about that because they scare the hell out of the seniors and saying, oh, you're going to lose this and you're going to lose that. Well, all this is going to be phased in and phased out. And, you know, they talk about, well, if we're going to change Social Security, if you're 55 and older, it won't affect you. Or, you know, there's always uh, guardrails in there to protect people and give you time to plan and adjust. But bottom line is if we don't change things on the trajectory, we're going to be broke in you know a decade. And so – uh, if we're really going to solve the problems that are facing America in the debt, uh, we as conservatives are going to have to be willing to suck it up and realize that, you know, some of it's going to touch us, too. And uh, it's uh, there, there's a lot of fluff out there, but uh, it, it's going to be a tough haul. And, and I hope we do it. I, I don't think we have a choice. How uh, as you walk the halls of the House of Representatives um, in the aftermath of the election last week, how tough is it to find an ever Trumper right now, Scott? <laughs> Um, I haven't seen one yet. He's a different Trump than he was eight years ago. No, he's you know, changed. He, he's changed. I mean, even even he, Trump said this morning, even the New York Times is like a different paper. They're, uh, they're giving credit where it's due. I've seen Jake Tapper and Dana Bash and Van Jones and, you know, giving Trump credit for his win. Uh, John Stewart, you maybe saw his comment. He said, you know, I don't think we have lawyers for this. He actually won the election the, fa- the way it's supposed to be done. And, uh, you know, he had a few expletives in there, too. But I appreciate the fact that, I mean, the, the biggest thing probably in my mind was that he is going to win the popular vote because that's always their argument. You know, it's, the Electoral College is broken. But by winning the popular vote, it's hard to deny that uh, this was a mandate by America, and uh, that gives us a lot of power going forward. Scott, thanks for spending time with us. Thanks for what you, for what you do in Washington, D.C. We'll be watching, and we'll be talking with you very, very soon. Take care. Sounds great. Thanks for having me on. All right, absolutely. This is Representative Scott Desjardins joining us for a few moments. No Never Trumpers up.